I'm going to be uh, talking today about China because I am the student at the Department of Sinology here at Charles, and um, my research topic is about comics and cartoons. So I decided to include a lot of those into the PowerPoint, so beware of that. And the topic of the talk is China Orientalized and Orientalizing, which is a sort of a buildup on what you were supposed to be reading for today's class. Um, the um, uh, paper by Arif Derlik, and also additionally, as a suggested literature, the book by uh, Christopher Frayling on all sorts of yellow peril representations in the late 19th, early 20th century, or rather the whole of the 20th century. Um, anyway, the first thing I would like to ask you before we go into the whole joy of orientalized China, um, do you recognize this quotation? In China, you know, the emperor is a Chinese and all those about him are Chinamen also. Do you know where it comes from? Okay, judging by the silence, not really. It's actually from a fairy tale called The Nightingale by Hans Christian Andersen. And the fairy tale was written and published in 1843. Uh, now, another question is, what mistakes can you recognize in this one sentence? 1843, what is wrong with the statement that the emperor is a Chinese? Well, it was the it was the different dynasty at that time, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, it wasn't, they weren't Chinese, right? They were Manchus. And for Chinese, of course, or what we call Chinese, this was a big issue, especially by the late 19th century or mid 19th century. Uh, what's wrong with the statement? All those about him are Chinamen also. Was there women, maybe? Well, to begin with, yes, there were women, naturally, as a species. They were supposed to have women somehow. And also, as, yeah. Yeah, I would say that Xi Jinping today would agree with it, actually. Well, uh, Xi Jinping today, yeah, maybe. Um, I would say that since they were not... Uh, Chinaman is a derogatory term, and apart from the derogatory intonation, which Hans Christian Andersen might not have implied, the fact that China consists not only of Chinese, but of a whole assortment of other ethnic groups is also there. And of course, by, um, we do call China, China, but at the time it was Qing Empire. And, you know, so this whole sentence is loaded with all sorts of faults. And this is probably a good point of departure for today's lecture, that this is the sort of average idea about how we exoticize China uh, or any other country, basically, and then the picture in the background um, is an image from a 1902 Russian collection of Hans Christian Andersen's stories. And while the illustration itself is quite well made for a book illustration, of course, it represents, again, this very standard image of an emperor, and that's an emperor with the nightingale, uh, with his long moustaches, the uh, pigtail coming for some reason from the very middle of his head, etc., etc., so this whole idea of orientalizing a nation and generalizing it into a very big unified mass is what we're going to explore today. Uh, so um, if you read paper uh, by Arif Derlik, you will notice that this is a quotation which he reproduces in his paper from Said, where he says that Said is adamant that Orientalism does not merely serve or represent power, but is itself a distribution of geopolitical awareness into aesthetic, scholarly, economic, sociological, historical, and philological texts. Now, let's try and see how this distribution of what Said and Ehrlich term as geopolitical awareness merge into our perceptions of China or perceptions of China throughout the 17th, 20th centuries in all these spheres of uh, human activity. So I will today start with the um, perceptions of China in the Western imagination from the 17th century. And then the second part of the lecture will be China's orientalization in the 20th century. And this includes more ideas of China itself thinking about itself. <laughs> 
Um, and you might note the image for the background on this slide, which is a picture with the first page of the first one of the first translations of Confucian texts into Latin uh, made in the 17th century and published in the 17th century. Uh, now, um, we all know fairly well that um, travel accounts and Jesuits translations played a big role um, in understanding China and in perceiving China in Europe in the um, late medieval, early new age, and then further on into, of course, uh, modern age. Uh, can anyone recognize this figure, maybe? Who is that person on the right? It's Matteo Ricci. Um, it's a standard iconography, and this first, um, this picture in the background is the front page or the frontispiece of this treatise with a very long Latin name, as was characteristic of the time. But basically, this is the treatise on China's uh, morals, laws, institutions, and other typical parts of what was noticeable about China, which was compiled by Matteo Ricci, and then further after his death by Nicolas Trigo, uh, and it was published in Augsburg in 1615. And that becomes one of the first most known texts about China, more or less scientific as compared to what we are used to thinking about, you know, like texts, which are very much intermingled mingled with fantasy, like, for example, Marco Polo's travels. So this is the first sort of introduction to China for Europe. And then, of course, there are other accounts, uh, travel and otherwise. For example, being a Russian, I could not... Uh, um, avoid this, um, there was a Cossack, Ivan Petlin, who traveled from Tobolsk to China, to, Be to Peking, in um, 1618, 1619. And upon his return, he wrote a treatise or a text describing his travel from Russia to Kitai state and Ob states, uh, describing other countries and Luces, as he calls them, um, that he encountered. Interestingly enough, and typically, unfortunately, um, the text was not published in Russia for a very long time. Uh, it was kind of put um, into a box and it was shelved um, in Russia, but it became fairly known in Europe because it was partly published in London only five years later in uh, 1624, 25, sorry. Then he also um, became known in other languages um, like German, Latin, French, etc. The Russian publication appeared in 1818, which was, uh, of course, by the time it was very much dated. And of course, Europe became familiar with um, China's sciences, uh, maths and other sciences and inventions. Um, and you will notice that this text was published in Prague in 1710, and it includes India and China together. So this whole notion of Far Orient uh, being kind of mingled together. Uh, now from the translations and from the whole idea of perceiving China as a source of wisdom, um, we develop into this whole culture of exploring new wisdom. And of course, uh, Gottfried Leibniz is the first or one of the first names that comes to anyone who notices how Chinese ideas were received and appropriated in Europe. Leibniz was familiar and he was among the first people to get familiar with this um, text, the picture from which I showed a couple of slides ago, the translations of Confucian texts, uh, which were published uh, in Paris in 1687. And he definitely was familiar with those texts. Uh, on which and um, on other things he developed his own perception of the world. Um, apart from Confucian principles, he also was inspired by other aspects of Chinese culture. For example, he was uh, familiar with the Book of Changes, and the background picture here is uh, the hexagrams which were sent to him by one of the Jesuits, Jesuit friends of his. Um, and uh, you will notice that these uh, hexagrams became a sort of inspiration for the binary numeral system where there are zero ones or full and divided lines in hexagrams and trigrams in Chinese um, book of changes, the Yi And also, of course, 
other mathematical phenomena were developed basing partly on the ideas found in China. And Chinese language itself was such a puzzlement, uh, such an inspiration for Leibniz that he developed, apart from other, you know, uh, uh, along with uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs and other strange writing systems that became um, known eventually in Europe, uh, there develops this idea of Characteristica Universalis or the universal language, the system of signs that will become a description of the world as it is, um, not as human um, emotions distorted, you know, because Leibniz, of course, was one of the great rationalists uh, of European philosophy. And there were many other phenomena, like the ideas of harmony and simple substance, which were inspired by Confucianism. Now, another person who was very strongly inspired by what became known about China in the 17th century was, of course, Voltaire. Um, and to begin with, I will start with something that is less well-known, probably. Um, his play, uh, The Orphan of China, which was largely based on a real Chinese play, which was composed in the 13th century and which was translated. It was one of the first fictional works, works of you know, fictional literature translated from Chinese into European languages. And you see here the cover of this uh, book, um, the French translation of The Orphan of the House of Zhao. And Voltaire was inspired by the storyline and he readopts the story, but he adjusts it so that it fits European or Western generally conventions of playwriting with the unity of place, unity of time, etc., etc. So um, we see how philosophy and science slowly drips down into, or drips up into, art and fictional literature. Uh, and then, of course, Voltaire was very much aware of the Confucian ethics. He was impressed by Confucius's lack of um, pretense, uh, the fact that Confucius never claimed any kind of prophecy, um, you know, prognostication uh, or anything. He was only dealing with the real things, with the real society, and, um, you know, um, things practical rather than imaginary. Um, and, of course, the idea of meritocracy and the enlightened monarchy became the one of the conceptual ideas for uh, this whole enlightenment in Europe. The idea that a monarch can be so wise that he doesn't need any kind of severe punishments or cruelty or wars in order to maintain the perfect government, which, of course, was very much untrue, but at that time, the knowledge was mostly from texts. And also China at the time was still on its upward part of the dynastic cycle. Um, and of course, as well, uh, Voltaire spoke about religious tolerance, again, saying, look at China, how it is uh, not fighting over religion, which was a big issue for Europe at the time. And then in, in more basic culture, you all know of the phenomenon of chinoiserie, uh, which was uh, very fashionable in the 17th and 18th centuries, which included and interspersed in all directions, including furniture, bagatelles, decorative items, architecture, furniture, you know, tiny things, big things, garden planning, clothes and fashion, um, fine arts and everything. And it was... Um, ultimately embodied in this Rococo style, which was um, such a massive eyesore. If you, you know, if you think of any Rococo building, it's too much. But that's what was uh, connected to this idea of leisure and luxury, because China and generally the Orient, as we also noticed from the previous lectures, were quite often um, exoticized through this perspective of joy de vivre, the joy of life and catching the moment and in not doing anything but spending your life with pleasure. Um, however, there is also the trouble with um, generalized perceptions. Um, so if you read um, or if you had the time to read Freiling's book, he quotes Williams in there where they say the Chinese had moved from inferiority to superiority in Euro-American perception without ever passing through equality and common humanity. And this is, of course, 
very important and it's equally applicable to the majority of orientalized countries because there is this they don't necessarily move from inferiority to superiority or vice versa but rather they remain at the same time inferior and superior but never human as equals um, and this is very interesting also i would i would say that this phrase the quote that you see on the slide right now it's partly true for the 20th century because Freiling is writing about how Chinese became from these inferior creatures into the supervillains. But if we see this movement from the 17th century, it is, of course, in the large picture, rather the movement from superiority to inferiority because by the 19th century, well, as you will all well know, China stopped being perceived as this example of moral government, perfect social arrangement, or any similar thing. It became a, a, you know, a, a country which is drowned in corruption, which is incapable of self-defense, um, and which is happy to buy opium and smoke it all along. Um, and from there, I would like to move to this picture. Now, again, a question to the audience. Can you please describe what you see here? I would say that it symbolizes like Christian mission and mm -hmm. conquest done by probably British. If yeah. you take a look at the armor. Yeah, that's right. So this figure represents Britain, Britannia. Okay. And the land they are conquesting is in Desiree. Mm, yeah, exactly. So this sort of land is uh, in some kind of disorder, right? Um, this figure is supposedly... I would say it's uh, an, uh, an archangel uh, Gabriel or something like that. Yeah, most probably because he has yeah, the flaming sword. That's right. And then... Over here, it looks quite insignificant, but that is actually the chief message of the picture. And, well, okay, let's go into some more details. So apart from Britannia, who is standing sort of in the end of the queue and there is another woman trying to drag her into the crowd, Britannia is very unwilling to join this pack. But then uh, the woman with the winged helmet is most probably Germany or Prussia. Um, uh, then there is uh, the woman wearing the Phrygian cape, France, uh, France and Marianne. And I cannot be certain about the attribution of other countries, but most probably other European nations. And of course, you notice immediately the, the Christian cross on top. But um, to, to take away the mystery, uh, this is a cartoon which was produced um, under the title The Yellow Peril. And it was designed by the idea of Kaiser Wilhelm II of Prussia. And uh, it was implemented by another person, uh, by an uh, engraver. Um, it was created in 1895. And of course, the idea is not so much that these women are trying, or European nations, are trying to conquer the land. It's rather that this is the European land, because if you notice the castles and churches, they look like the normal European um, landscape. But from the east comes this fire and black smoke and the idol, the golden idol of be it Buddhism or a Chinaman sitting on this pedestal, whichever it is, but they bring darkness and horror. And there appears this massive narrative of the yellow peril. Now, when Kaiser Wilhelm was inspired by this beautiful idea that nations of Europe need to join in the defense of Europeans' faith and homes. Um, it was the time when Japan had a victory over China in the, the first Sino-Japanese War, 1894-1895. So, of course, when Kaiser Wilhelm was thinking about this and sending this cartoon as a sort of message to his fellow royal houses across Europe, he was trying to convince the world, or the European center, according to him, that Europe needs to stand against and stand up against this whole tremendous power that is rising in the East and going to threaten 
um, European values. So wars in Asia, the Opium Wars, the Indian Rebellion, all sorts of conflicts elsewhere um, became an issue of the 19th century. Then, of course, there was the phenomenon where Chinese started quite active migration into Europe and America. And because Martin Lahota mentioned some of the history of this American uh, Chinese, I will not be going into this, but you have to bear in mind that a good deal of Chinese started moving outside of China into what was perceived as the heartland of Europe and America. Um, it stimulated the development of racial theories uh, with this idea that there are um, mongoloids, europeoids, and afroids, the white, black, and yellow, basically, and hence this um, word um, yellow peril or yellow threat. Um, and then, of course, the fact, like I mentioned, the fact that Japan had victory over China, and even more importantly, it won over Russia in 1905, in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, uh, that triggered, and of course, Kaiser Wilhelm could then write to Nicholas II saying, I told you so, uh, and you didn't listen. Uh, so this whole mm, amassing of ideas how East is going to attack West, and Japan and China will sort of unite and attack and destroy the West, that became a standing idea. Uh, of course, it was only further triggered by the Ikhatuan Rebellion or Boxer Rebellion, as, as it is better known, uh, where they either indeed killed a number, well, they did kill a number of uh, Westerners in China. And also, of course, this was very much exager exaggerated. And the, um, the, because this was already the time of photographs, there's visual horrors of a Westerner being killed by an Asian, and the corpse is mutilated to the degree of unrecognizability. That, of course, only further triggered this panic and hysteria of perceiving the Asians as a threat. Um, this also gave the justification to policies towards Asian colonies and semi-colonies, as, for example, China. And also, it's important to bear in mind that there was this very mixed perception of Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, Mongols, and, you know, anything that has almond-shaped eyes. Who cares about the details? Um, and if you, again, if you uh, know about the statistics of how many Chinese, for example, lived in London, there were a couple hundred um, in the late 19th century. But from this couple hundred Chinese, there was this over-exaggeration from a fly into an elephant, uh, because, of course, apart from Chinese, there were also Japanese, Koreans, uh, Laskars, what was called uh, Laskars, uh, which are um, Southeastern nationals in, um, in, in Europe, etc., etc. So this whole mix-up of who they actually are and who cares who they are, this created the perception that they are everywhere, they are omnipresent, and they are beginning to become powerful. Um, in Russia, for example, this was, of course, a big issue because Russia had this uh, tremendous, shocking um, loss of the war against a yellow nation. And this is a cartoon from the PhD paper by one of my former colleagues um, who uh, wrote a, a paper on yellow peril. Um, and uh, this image is from 1904, and as you see, there is this dragon, the embodiment of Asia or Ch China, Japan, whichever you choose, and he's pretty much vomiting up these hordes and hordes and masses of bodies, which are indistinguishable one from another. They're just flowing in this horrendous mass of um, bodies which will come and engulf and encroach and swarm. And there are all those words which mean that there will be a mass of threatening identical creatures coming and attacking us. So there is um, this idea of depersonified mass of yellow hordes. But then, of course, it is very much juxtaposed to the idea of personified threat. For example, Dr. Fu Manchu. Uh, and I don't know how many of you actually watched any of the Fu Manchu films or read any of books about him, 
uh, but they are quite an assembly of um, stereotypes. I will show you a couple of slides later. And of course, the whole idea of Asians being threatening uh, were reconfirmed by the vilifying habits and the threatening physiology. Um, Chinese and Asians were always, uh, they spoke in this weird sounding foreign language. They had very peculiar behavior. They ate unusual food. They wore exotic clothes. They um, got engaged in mysterious rituals and religion. And they were probably spreading some horrible diseases that science has never heard of. They practice strange torture and they are very indifferent to death. So it's all this strange, un unusual alien ideas about what Asians are, which of course have very little to do with reality, but who cares about that? And of course, there was the habit of opium smoking. And beautifully, again, um, there is a phrase that um, uh, in Europe, some of the theoreticians behind this yellow peril notion, uh, they would say, well, Chinese have always smoked opium. Uh, and they will always continue. Well, they didn't always smoke it. It was actually Europeans who brought opium as a drug to China, right? So this whole guilt assignment is, of course, also askew. But from here, it is probably useful to bear in mind that this is, again, still very much the same as Orientalism in a wider sense. And this is a cartoon from 2001, and it was published soon after 9-11. And this was the time when the states were going through the discussions over what to do and how to step down on terrorism. And you see here that there is this bunch of pesky kids in the car keeping asking their father, um, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And the um, father is very much intent on concentrating. He's concentrated on the idea of driving the car through this hordes of flying fly like um, terrorists. And of course, there is this complete and utter dehumanization in the, in, in, representa in the representation of people as flies. And this is similar to an extent to the way China and Japan were again depicted in, for example, the Crocodile magazine. And this is quite a different situation because in 19, uh, 1938, uh, and Crocodile, I have to remind to the younger ones of you probably, uh, that Crocodile was the um, magazine of satire and um, political cartooning published in the Soviet Union from 1922 all the way to 1991, and it even continued after the Soviet Union collapsed. It was similar to what you had here in Czechoslovakia as uh, Dikobraz and Rohač. Um, so this magazine, uh, in 1938, published a couple of cartoons where it was trying to support China's defense against, or China's resistance against Japanese aggression, because 1937, as you will know, was the year when the Second Sino-Japanese War started. But it's very interesting. So in the first cartoon, in the left one, you see that there is the map of China, which is sort of covered in a, some kind of gooey substance, which makes the Japanese flies, which are uh, signed like this, they are samurai flies, it, it makes them get stuck. So Japanese get stuck in this mass of China's territory. But it's an interesting representation of a war of resistance, isn't it? Instead of representing people fighting, it represents insects getting stuck to a piece of paper, which is, again, a kind of dehumanizing metaphor, even though Crocodile was obviously trying to support China in its war of resistance. Or there is another similar one where the roles are slightly changed. So here the insects, the bees, are Chinese who are trying to defend their houses, the beehives, against the Japanese bear. Now, again, to represent a resisting nation as bees, bees are, of course, in Russian you know, mentality and um, perception. Bees are far more useful than flies, but it's still not exactly a very human metaphor, is it? 
So this is a very peculiar way of looking at a nation or at a mass of nations. And again, who will actually notice the difference between these and those insects? Flying creatures, who cares? Um, and again, um, in a similar period in the West, um, slightly earlier, there was the first film from the Fu Manchu series made in 1932. And you immediately, this is this, um, the moment when you see Fu Manchu for the first time. So this is the film. And from the start of the film, you get this idea that there is this horrendous villain who is going to um, assemble forces and destroy civilization. And look at this. So first of all, the, of course, the actor who plays uh, Fu Manchu is a Westerner. It was Boris Karloff. He is my, made up to look, I don't know, Chinese. Can you call this Chinese? Vaguely. Um, but he's placed right next to this convex mirror, which distorts the face. The face that is already made to look quite intimidating. It's made completely unhuman by this distorted, shapeless mouth, nose, and slanting eyes. But then Fu Manchu has a daughter. And this is the daughter of Fu Manchu, obviously a very Chinese girl. And of course, every China girl was uh, wearing this sort of hairdress on the daily basis in 1932. There is no doubt about that. And she makes a prophecy at the banquet that his, uh, her father is holding. And she says, Genghis Khan comes back. Now, how are Chinese supposed to be delighted about, about the fact that Genghis Khan comes back? But of course, this is not intended for Chinese. This is for Western audiences who consider Genghis Khan to be the conqueror in human history. Um, and of course, she then says um, something, we will come swarming to recapture the world. And she actually uses this very word, swarming. You know, again, it's this perception on the verbal level as well as on the visual level. We perceive Asians, Chinese, as a mass of creatures without individuality or identity. And of course, I will not go into the details of who these creatures are. Maybe they are magi from greeting Jesus, who knows. Um, and from here, we move to something that, you know, we think, well, okay, this was 1932. Today, we have similar perceptions. For example, a quick Google search will give you something like this, feng shui tips for beginners on how to apply feng shui principles to your home. And then you get a picture which has very little resemblance to anything. Um, and of course, apparently, feng shui is about how to locate an armchair so that your feng is drifting through the right places, uh, which was not exactly what feng shui geomancy practice was about, because it was more about how to locate a good site for your uh, father's grave. Um, or, for example, there is something even more odious, in my opinion. Um, there is this phenomenon of quotations. Um, if you, for example, this one, if you wait by the river long enough, the bodies of your enemies will float by. Well, it says Sun Tzu, the art of war. If any of you read the art of war, there is no such thing. This comes from the novel by um, James Clavell, and it's called Shogun, and that's where the, idioms, the idiom comes from. And then, of course, it became part of history. It, sort of floated into public culture or pop culture rather. And Sun Tzu had nothing to do with it. And neither has the Terracotta warrior have anything to do with Sun Tzu, let's say openly. But then of course, if we think about something less, um, less popish and more scientific, uh, a very serious scholar, Paul Goldin, had to actually write a, an article which is titled those who don't know speak translations of Lao Tzu by people who do not know Chinese. Now, this is beautiful. Um, I will read the first paragraph of this, um, of this article because it says, nowhere are the vices of thin description more apparent than in American expropriations of Taoism. 
It has often been said that Lao Tzu or Tao Te Ching is the most frequently translated work next to the Bible, but that exception may no longer hold. A typical bookstore in the United States today will have several different versions of the Tao Te Ching on its shelves, and Americans purchase more copies of that Chinese classic than of Goethe, Moliere, and possibly Aristotle. This trend is not surprising. The recent proliferation of Tao Te Ching translations is simply a consequence of the increasing great general interest in Asian thought. What is disturbing, however, is that alongside the many competent works marketed at reasonable prices by a large assortment of publishers, there are now several offerings by people who declare without embarrassment that they have no knowledge of the Chinese language, let alone the ancient idiom of the Tao Te Ching. So this is the sort of pop perceptions of Chinese culture that we still have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, and of course, this bears a lot of um, meaning for study of China and for the perceptions of China until to this very day. Um, now, um, this is where I will move to the next part of my talk about China's self-perceptions and perceptions of the West. And this is based on uh, cartoons from two decades. Uh, the first decade is 1930s, when in Shanghai there was a whole assembly of cartoon magazines produced by a group of very outstanding um, cartoonists, starting with Lu Shaofei and then continuing with Ye Tianyu, uh, Zhang Guangyu, and, and a great number of other names. And Zhang Guangyu was, of course, famous for participation later in the production of Sun Yukun uh, animated movies, which you must have seen if you uh, study China. Um, but this image, of course, is telling in itself. This is from the 1930s. Oh, and the second decade will be 1950s with the communist propaganda. Um, this image is very disturbing. It's called spring plowing uh, from the 1930s uh, with a Chinese peasant, a very uh, famished figure, trying to plow the field of skulls. And of course, this is how China perceived itself in the 1930s, where war upon war had been waged for the previous couple of decades after the revolution. And even before the revolution, China was for a century in this state of um, semi-colonization. And at the same time, Manchu dynasty, of course, by that time was in a state of decline, nearing collapse. Uh, now, the Western civilization was perceived differently, of course. Uh, I do not intend to make any big generalizations, but um, this is a cartoon from 1934, a magazine called Shudai Manhua, Contemporary Cartoons or Modern Sketch, it was called. And it's explicitly called uh, Xiang Wenming, uh, the Western civilization or Western culture. And you see that for the Western culture, first there is a row of very naked girls dancing the Kan Kan dance. Then there is a row of very much clad to the degree where you don't actually see any skin soldiers uh, wearing gas masks. Behind them is row upon row of buildings, factories, uh, something that looks like the White House, um, something that looks like a pyramid. And then there is a priest who sort of blesses this whole madness with a Bible and the cross. And behind the priest, who is also wearing the gas mask, uh, there is this pallid countenance of the Queen of Hearts. And it, it may or may not be the representation of China who is sort of being stomped by these armies of Westerners. And this, of course, sort of reverses the metaphor of Asians swarming over Europe into the narrative of West stomping over and destroying China. On the other hand, of course, um, there was Japan, and Japan was also perceived not in the most warm lights. And this cartoon is called The Street Angel, as you see, and it, um, in the brackets it explains that this is a, a sketch of a Japanese woman. Uh, now, I will not go into too much details, into too many details here, but again you see that the Western influence, apparently on Japan in this case, has led the country to this state of prostitution, bars, sailors, and 
general vice. Um, China itself felt very much alone in the cold waters, whereas the other countries, and they're signed here, the European smaller countries, uh, Europe's smaller countries, uh, Germany, Austria, uh, Austria, Italy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And China is an old man, and you will notice that he is quite fair-skinned. He's not yellow, right? They did not consider themselves yellow. Um, but uh, he's very much um, uncomfortable about the whole situation in which he finds himself. Um, and again, another version of the same narrative, China here is a one-legged cripple with a crutch who, who walks through this borderland forest, and you see the title of the cartoon is right here, it's Borderland. Um, he walks through this very threatening forest, from the tree branches of which there appear the monsters of Japanese imperialism or Japanese militarism, capitalism, and this is most likely Bolshevism or communism. So China is kind of finding itself, again, as an old, incapacitated man, under the threat from these monstrous entities. And isn't this the same as the yellow threat, only reversed to China's realities and self-perceptions? Um, or again, Japan, you would think, well, to Europeans or to Westerners, uh, Japan, China, Korea, Mongolia, something narrow-eyed, who cares? But here is the Japanese and the Mongolian because this is 1936, and this is the time when Mongolia was a sort of puppet state for, um, or a region of Mongolia was a puppet state for uh, for Japan. And um, you will notice that, of course, this is partly the caricature of Tozio, the Times Minister, of, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, but it's also a generalized cartoon of a Japanese wearing round eye, you know, um, eyeglasses, very toothy very ugly and very much green yellow skinned right if you remember the chinese was quite fair skinned on the china's own cartoon here you see that there is almost no humanity in either of these figures again um but the trouble is of course that china itself does not appear so united for example there is this cartoon in the 1934 issue of shudai manhua uh, where you see this very westernized Chinese couple wearing very much Western clothes, drinking some nice drinks from straws, uh, sitting at the table and talking, and the remarks on the side say, well, why do peasants complain that they don't have water? Why don't they just drink Coke instead? And of course, this brings associations with the uh, apocryphal lady of court of Marie Antoinette, who said, well, let them eat cake. Um, but it shows how China itself was divided into this, you know, hardcore Chinese peasants and westernized urbanites. But then who are these urbanites? Aren't they Chinese as well? Who is then allowed to speak for China? Where is China that can be itself? And then we go, go to the 1950s. And in the 1950s, of course, Maoist. Um, slogans and narratives become dominant. And you will probably all know this idea of the American imperialism is a paper tiger, uh, um, uh, and here is this um, paper tiger. This uh, metaphor for paper tiger appeared quite early in the 1950s. And this paper tiger in particular consists of photographs uh, where American soldiers surrender. And this is, of course, the reference to the victory of what was perceived as victory of Chinese and Korean army uh, in the Korean War on Korean Peninsula. Uh, and there are also photographs of Latin American peoples um, protesting against American influence, American factories being shut down because of unemployment and overproduction, and of course American rockets fall, whereas the Soviet rockets fly into the sky towards the moon. Uh, so there is this whole assembly of perceptions of the West as a failure. And this, of course, is not the division between East and West as it was in the 19th century. 
It's rather the division between socialist countries and capitalist countries. And this sh shifts this whole racial paradigm because it changes the perception of the white man. Because, of course, Soviets were in these years still very much close allies to the Chinese. It changes the notion of Westerner as an enemy or as an ally into this division of socialist versus capitalist countries. Uh, China in this narrative is represented sometimes as a dragon. And you can see these are cartoons which were made by three different people. This cartoon was made by Wu Yun and these two are made by two other cartoonists. And yet they look almost identical. You know, they you could cut this dragon out of this paper and insert it here and it would look perfectly in place. Uh, so this dragon, rep dragon boat, it represents China's industry as opposed to the industry of Britain, because here is John Bull. And John Bull is, of course, shipwrecked on the rocks of crisis, whereas China is successfully moving forward. And here is the dragon boats uh, representing people's communes because this is 1959, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, or sometimes China would be represented as a human. Quite often it would be instead of dragons. And this cartoon, there were this panel of cartoons. So there is uh, John Bull, and he is signed as England or Britain here. Um, so it's England being represented as a you know personified image, not Doctor Fu Manchu, but John Bull. And he is saying, he says, um, oh, finally, I can have a little bit of rest. I can take a breath. And then he notices that there is still some threat. He has to run and then he sort of cannot run anymore. And he is overtaken by China because at that time there was a slogan of to catch up with and to overrun England um, in production of steel and pig iron. Uh, so in the caption or in the commentary to this cartoon, you discover that there is this explanation about England's or Britain's newspaper times writing, we can finally take a breath because this horrible dragon, and there is actually a bracketed comment, they mean China, can doesn't pursue us anymore. But of course, the dragon is not pursuing them. It's the human China that's pursuing them. And you see that this is a youthful person. But it's adorable that they have to explain to Chinese readers, and this is a cartoon from a Chinese magazine, Manhua, um, that they have to explain to Chinese readers, well, you know, yeah, when they say dragon, they mean China. I honestly don't know if it needed explication like this. I have no idea how Chinese readers were receiving these images, but it's symptomatic in itself, I would say. Uh, and of course, China was very much um, ahead of the planet in this whole defending national liberation movements, fighting for peace, and even standing up to America and Britain, etc., uh, etc. Et it's beautiful to notice, in my opinion, Cartoons where there is a, a row of socialist countries or just generally peaceful nations. And so here you see this Dove of Peace with the band Hepin Peace Park Mirror, etc. Um, so th this is the Soviet person, presumably wearing this sort of average suit. There is the Chinese, um, and he wears a sort of um, Sun Yat-sen style French jacket. And there are probably Vietnamese, Tibetans, whoever else they might be. And they're all sort of wearing, you know, this more or less average clothes, maybe with this exception of the yellow um, cardigan sort of thing. But other than that, they're really wearing something that you can wear on a daily basis. And then on the right side are the Europeans. Presumably, what are they? Hungarians, Germans? Czechoslovaks, who knows? Uh, but they are definitely wearing something that to our eyes looks very much orientalized. So again, there is this reversal of who is orientalizing whom. And this is again something that I find extremely interesting in this uh, whole idea of how we actually perceive somebody who is not quite like us. Um, and of course, um, the one of the most famous phrases from the 1950s was uh, that Eastern wind overtakes Western wind. Dongfeng, Dadao, Sifeng. Um, and again, this is a beautiful cartoon made by uh, 
uh, Zhang Guangyu, I think, yeah, Zhang Guangyu, uh, where the sun of socialism is rising, whereas the sun of capitalism is falling down into crises and graves and all sorts of horrors. Uh, from here, let us move to more contemporary times. And I have a typo here, which I did not notice. Beijing is spelled with one I, not two in the first syllable, sorry. Uh, but Beijing Olympics in 2008 became an important moment for China. They were so important that 10 years later, in 2018, there was an article to commemorate this Beijing Olympics. And there was not only one article, but there was a whole publicity action to commemorate the great achievements of the Olympic Games in China. And in this um, one of the articles, it says, describing the opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics, it says, the first part, brilliant civilization, highlighted Chinese civilization. And the second part, glorious era, showcased modern China and its dream of harmony between the peoples of the world. Beautiful, isn't it? And then, of course, it went... Beginning with the unfurling of a giant scroll painting, the ceremony went on to present the nation's written script, an operatic stage, ritual music, and the four great inventions, the compass, gunpowder, papermaking, and printing. Icons such as the Silk Road were also interpreted on stage to highlight China's opening and creativity. And of course, well, the photograph is the printing uh, technology. Um, showcasing... The achievements of China's civilization is something that brings to memory what uh, Derlich writes about how orientalized nations seem to rely on their past so much. But for China, this reliance on the past is very much a, a, a trampoline to jump further into the future and to reclaim its important position in the world. Because, of course, for China, it was never... Um, a sort of low hole, you know, re re backward nation, apart from some unfortunate years. Uh, it was always the central kingdom, the middle kingdom, etc., etc. And of course, reference to the Silk Road is important because um, one of China's, what you might actually call orientalizing trends, is the Belt and Road Initiative, which sort of colonizes the Middle Asia, the Central Asia, um, by China to an extent. And so there is this mixture of messages interwoven into the ritual of Beijing Olympics. Um, and of course, there is also the issue of cinematic battles. And you will remember last year's scandal. But before we go to last year's scandal, um, I would like to remind you about Kung Fu Panda, and um, there was also some scandal about Kung Fu Panda because some Chinese critics have called for a boycott because Steven Spielberg, an executive at DreamWorks, quit his role as artistic advisor to the Beijing Olympics to protest China's links to the Sudanese government. And um, again, this is a reference to the Beijing Olympics. And um, it's amazing how a film can become a symbol and a weapon to demonstrate the protest against against something. Um, and there was also a Chinese artist who features pandas in his work, Zhao Bandi, uh, who also called for people to shun the film, saying that foreigners were profiteering from China's national symbol. So panda can only be used by Chinese because pandas are only in China. And, you know, there is such a phenomenon as panda diplomacy, etc., um, and last year's scandal was, of course, around Mulan, um, because be even before the film appeared, uh, even before it became uh, an item, uh, the actress who played um, the chief role, the key role in the film, posted a tweet about um, her support of the Hong Kong police um, against Hong Kong protesters. So, of course, there was the outcry in the, outcry in the West. How can she say something like this. Then later, when the film was published, as you will uh, know, um, the scandal was uh, about how uh, in the titles, the producers thanked Xinjiang government for supporting because some of the filming was made in Xinjiang. And people were saying, well, how can you support Xinjiang government? Because it's um, while it's uh, torturing Uyghurs, apart from Uyghurs, there are Kazakhs and a number of other ethnic groups. Um, how can you support them? They are 
torturing people and you say thank you on behalf of the Disney Corporation. Uh, but inside of China, there was also a great deal of contradiction over the film. And so, for example, there was uh, a number of um, reviews, and one of them said the shell was Chinese, but the soul was, soul was still foreign. Uh, it was a foreign superficial understanding of China. Or another review said the background story of Mulan is that she wanted to take her father's place, protect her family and defend the people. But the film turned Hua Mulan into a palace guard protecting the emperor. The people that Hua Mulan wanted to defend became the grand background. Uh, and this is a review posted on WeChat. So it was, um, you know, it's spoken by Chinese about their own um, narratives, which was then reappropriated by the West. Or also there were, of course, also voices um, in support of Uyghurs. Uh, for example, a woman uh, said, as a sister of a concentration camp victim, a woman and an attorney, I believe in female empowerment. But when I saw that they partners with these Xinjiang agencies, I felt that they were reducing Mulan from a symbol of female strength to an endorsement of female oppression. Uh, and you will probably know that uh, Mulan has been boycotted by the more um, active, uh, you know, politically and socially active people um, on principle, uh, that this does not fit either China's view of the world, nor the Western values. So such a simple thing as a film suddenly becomes the object of a fight over the whole thing. But then, of course, this brings us to the last part. How could I do a presentation about China in 2021 without mentioning coronavirus? No chance. Uh, and there is this um, um, Swedish-Korean girl uh, who started making cartoons about her clashes with uh, her fellow citizens um, when, you know, on a daily basis when she leaves the house and she encounters all sorts of uh, discrimination against, um, again, yellow, you know, uh, just because she is Asian, she suddenly encounters all sorts of uh, offense and abuse. And she had, uh, she gave an interview and the interviewer asked her, you have a background in studying languages and comparative literature. There have been top government officials in the US using phrases like Chinese virus and reportedly Kung flu. Have you seen a connection between harmful language and the rise of xenophobia toward the Asian community? And she answered, the imagery that is being used and the language that's being used is not new. It's just that now people are using coronavirus and COVID and linking the medical language to this sort of yellow humor, yellow peril idea and putting them together. I definitely believe that language can be used to dehumanize people and that it can cause great harm. Um, and this uh, brings me to my concluding remarks. Um, first, that obviously yellow peril is still very much alive, and it might be partly that closer interactions without trying to understand each other deeper are actually only triggering it rather than solving it. Um, this whole fashion for all sorts of things Chinese, you know, wisdom of Confucius, feng shui, and, um, you know, all sorts of exoticism, um, and other varieties of what to me are explicitly false knowledge is still very much here. And it's amazing how in the time of, you know, Google being a click away, uh, we still fall for all sorts of um, strange knowledge. Then there are um, there is the issue of how in the 20th century the definitions and borders between West and East shifted, um, and how socialism and capitalism became the defying geopolitical notions. But today's juxtapositions are, of course, quite different from what was in the middle of the 20th century, and there is an idea that uh, later on there will be the clash between colonizers and colonized. And there is a question of who ends up on which side. Or, of course, there is um, Huntington with his clash of civilizations. Uh, but that's something that I will not go into. Um, China emphasizes its own otherness in many various ways. I did not go into political statements of Xi Jinping, for example, as was suggested in the start of this lecture by uh, Martin, I think. Uh, but... Um, I tried to go more into this sort of popular propaganda styles, uh, 
But um, China definitely works on its own otherness. It emphasizes that it's different and it sort of caters to this consumerist desire for something exotic. And this applies also to the sphere of tourism, cuisine, fashions, all sorts of things, and, you know, cultural productions, literature, films, etc. And then, of course, there is the question of who can actually study and represent China and the Chinese. So who can study is the question for us, for China scholars. Um, do we dare study China? Or there is also the question, well, can Chinese abstract themselves, disengage themselves from their cultural identity and background and study themselves in an unbiased fashion? So can they study themselves then? And there is the matter of who can represent China. Then again, there is this issue of Mulan. So who can speak for Mulan? Who can speak for pandas? Um, that's the big question. And then I will finish with the question mark, as I like to do. Uh, so Derlich writes, this requires also that we conceive an alternative modernity, uh, conceive of alternative modernities that take as their point of departure, not a reified past legacy, but a present of concrete everyday cultural practices where it is no longer possible to tell what is identifiably Chinese or identifiably Western. And I will ask you to maybe sort of start the discussion part, the question, well, are there these alternative historic trajectories that Derlich writes about? And here I will probably stop my presentation and go into, um, into our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. And um, there are some questions. Uh, first one, uh, could you give some remarks on labels like Chinese virus or Hong Kong flu and their possible or maybe probable connections to the concept of uh, yellow peril? Thank you. Yes, that um, is a difficult question for the primary reason that um, by assigning any names, we of course limit the meanings of some complicated notions. So by, by assigning a title, we sort of assign some meaning to an event which can be far more complicated than one meaning. So in case of Chinese, you know, the, the, the case of calling COVID the Chinese virus, or when we remember Hong Kong flu, or whichever other disease that has been assigned a particular name, such as the Spanish flu or the French disease, it doesn't necessarily lead to the interpretation of yellow peril or some form of Orientalism, but it certainly means that we assign negative pejorative meanings to a kind of association with a nation. And it is for this reason, I think, that Chinese tend to object to the title of COVID as the Chinese disease or Chinese virus. And it is for the same reason that many other Asian nations who have nothing to do with China, per se, object just as much because they tend to become involved in this very wide narrative. For example, when Koreans are confused with Chinese outside of Asia, and they are suddenly forced to carry the, if we may call it so, the guilt for um, the virus that happened to occur in China. So I would not say that this is not quite the representation of yellow peril. It, it coincides with the yellow peril in the sense that it, it, the virus comes from Asia. So there is this idea of Asia as the place and the source of um, malignant diseases and some unpredictable horrors. But I would say that it's not necessarily an Asian phenomenon, right? Such attribution of a nation to something that is negative, it can be found outside of Oriental cultures. So it's not so much Orientalism as a sort of xenophobia in general. When we attribute something negative to a culture which is in some sense 
antagonized or opposed to our own culture. And I think that's uh, what I can say. Does the yellow peril uh, pervade all Western knowledge and imagination concerning China? Well, um, to answer this question, we, we need to probably deconstruct it into many layers. Uh, because, of course, uh, there is no such thing as all Western knowledge, nor is there such a thing as, you know, yellow peril that pervades everything. Um, yellow peril shows itself in a number of fictional works, as is shown in a great deal of research existing about it. It appears sometimes in comics, in in fictional novels, in works of cinematography, but it's not omnipresent even there. It appears at times, depending on the political situation, on the imagination of the author, uh, or on the fashions of the moment. Uh, so even in fictional works, there is no such thing as omnipresent ever pervading or ever aggressive yellow peril perception. But if we speak about science or about political knowledge, I do not think that yellow peril is at all present there. So for example, when we are speaking about uh, research, it can be assumed it, or it can be claimed with a great degree of certainty that almost no uh, experts on China have any sort of yellow peril perceptions of China because by traveling to China, by familiarizing ourselves with the, you know, the, the life and customs and political history and social arrangements in China, we learn that um, yellow peril has almost no grounds or it has very little to do with reality. Uh, so for anyone who is at least a little bit, you know, familiar with China, yellow peril does not appear to be a serious item. It's a, it's a figment of imagination, I would say. So I, I would say that um, this whole question is a little bit oversimplifying. It oversimplifies the problem of Orientalism. It merges it into one notion of yellow peril. Uh, and at the same time, it sort of assumes that everyone in the West thinks the same way as everybody else, which is, of course, not, not applicable on any plane of meaning. So I would say that, no, yellow peril does not pervade Western knowledge of China, nor does it pervade Western knowledge of what we can call, in quotation marks, the Orient. And the uh, third question, uh, if you could uh, briefly describe the changes in the image of China in Chinese cartoons from 1930s to 1950s showed in your lecture, was there uh, some development from uh, negative to positive uh, self-view? Yes, um, there was definitely a very large change. Uh, the first thing that should be mentioned is that uh, in the 1930s, the cartoonists worked for a private enterprise, or rather for many private enterprises. For example, one of the most famous ones was the Shudai Manhua, which was um, um, owned by a person with a very interesting biography, Shao Xunmei, and uh, he definitely had very little uh, relations with the government in the sense that the magazine he produced was his private initiative. It was in no way the instrument of government propaganda and the magazine was even censored for a couple of months or maybe for four months um, during its uh, sh rather short life of existence in general. So um, the idea that in the 1930s, cartoons reflected more of the lower level opinions, the opinions of urbanites, but not government officials is the first important difference in comparison to the 1950s when of course the Chinese government was behind all of the media, mass media, uh, including of course Manhua magazine, which was produced 
from the 1950, from the year 1953 as the um, um, government uh, institution. Uh, it was definitely part of the state propaganda, the communist propaganda, and this certainly changed the way so China portrayed itself there. That's one thing. The other thing that is also quite important is that in the 1930s, China objectively was in the position of very poor economic condition, constant wars, minor conflicts, major conflicts, and of course this um, threat from the Japanese imperialism and militarism, as it was perceived in China in the 1930s, was definitely something that shaped the worldview and the self-view of Chinese. Therefore, in the cartoons, we find them crippled, injured, suffering, the sick man of Asia. Whereas in the 1950s, the situation changes quite radically. China sees itself, or at least the Communist Party sees China as the younger brother of this great Soviet Union, elder brother. And of course, since the Soviet Union was kind of achieving fantastic goals, such as sending the Sputnik into the outer space or implementing all of its magnificent five-year plans or seven-year plans, as it was in the 1959 to 1965, of course, Soviet, the Soviet Union and its um, policies were perceived as the embodiment of strength and power. And the fact that China was following in this trail and itself was showing what the, the propaganda presented as magnificent achievements as well. Um, the more magnificent, the closer we get to the Great Leap Forward years. But even before then, uh, it was, of course, a tremendous change compared to the previous decades. Therefore, the self-image of China in the 1950s is this kind of um, rainbow-colored magnificence, you know, with the... Uh, all the glorious perspectives ahead of us, we are finally awakened, we are finally risen from our knees, and we are going to have a magnificent, glorious future. So this sort of self-perception was very strongly promoted in the cartoons from the 1950s. And this is, of course, fundamentally different from the pictures of 1930s. And it also um, affects the way world and world affairs, international relations were seen in the 1930s and in the 1950s. So we find the West as the um, source of inspiration sometimes for the 1930s, but very seldom um, in the 1950s, because of course in the 1950s, it's already the antagonism of two systems, two camps, the socialist camp and the capitalist camp. And this changes the whole perspective so we have a next question. Uh, did the Orientalist representation of China, bo both in the East and in the West, uh, change after the proclamation of the People's Republic of China? Um, I think yes, and it's related to the answer to the previous question. Uh, because self-representation of China was very much connected to being part of the socialist camp. And of course, for countries outside of China, it affected how China was perceived for themselves. So whether we're talking about, for example, the United States of America or the United Kingdom, of course, China became part of this red thread, red peril. So the color changes, but the, 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 the word peril kind of remains. Or, for example, if we consider Soviet, the Soviet Union or other countries like I think Czechoslovakia, um, Poland, or other countries from the socialist camp, naturally belonging to the same camp me meant that for everyone, official propaganda stimulated this idea of socialist unity, fraternity, equality, and all moving towards the same ultimate goal of communism. And I think this, of course, affects the way countries were looking at each other. And also, there was a great deal of contact between all the countries in the socialist camp. 
So there would be a lot of students going on exchanges. There were a lot of cultural partnerships, theaters exchanging, translations of literature and so on and so forth. And of course, this stimulates familiarization with each other, learning about each other. Um, so I would say this changes the, the, the whole framework. Instead of Orientalism as such, we end up with another form of antagonism, um, the antagonism between socialist and capitalist countries again. And it's the sort of Cold War um, separation which sort of becomes the new form for the same idea of Orientalism. It's again the same us versus them, but the limits and the borders shift and change. And I, I guess that's what is important with the establishment of the People's Republic of China. Who's the audience for propaganda in your examples, like in Manhua? Um, the primary audience were, as far as I know, the local readers. So both in cases of, for example, Manhua and Shudai Manhua, so the 1930s and the 1950s uh, magazines, the readers were local Chinese, primarily urbanites, I would say, because their literacy rates were higher. But Manhua was definitely also provided to rural communities and it was read among other um, educational materials and propaganda materials, sometimes if needed with the commentary from somebody who can read or who is more familiar with contemporary events. So it was directed as a means of propaganda for all layers of Chinese society. It was hardly directed and aimed at foreign consumers, even though Manhua magazine, the um, communist one, was provided to the socialist camp countries, but it's um, probably unlikely to imagine that uh, Manhua was widely read outside of China, either in um, Chinese overseas communities or in the non-Chinese uh, societies. For example, in, in uh, Russia, in the libraries, the Manhua magazine is only available in the whole of St. Petersburg, for example, it is only available in the Library of the Oriental Manuscripts, which is one and not very easily accept accessible library at the Russian Academy of Science institution, which is definitely not for every reader. So I would say these magazines were not particularly aimed at the general audience outside of China. There were specific magazines which were created for foreign audiences, such as, for example, uh, the magazine Druzhba, which was published in the Soviet Union, and it was about Sino-Soviet friendship. And then it was, of course, stopped in publication towards the 1960s. But um, yeah, Manhua and Shudai Manhua were both primarily for Chinese audiences inside of China. There were examples of armies caricatured like flies or bees in your presentation. Uh, is this depiction a sign of Orientalist de dehumanization or do armies just suppress one's individuality to succeed in their mission? Um, that's a good question because um, it's, it's a kind of an uptake on what do we actually define as Orientalism? As I think many of the previous questions were as well, we sort of try to establish what we can call Orientalist and what we shall not call Orientalist and how far we um, can actually extrapolate Said's notion of Orientalism onto a very different world than even 40 years ago when, um, or 30 years ago uh, when Said's works became so influential. Um, I would say that you're absolutely right in the sense that armies do function as this sort of ant-like organization where individual decisions shall not overwhelm the general command. That is certainly true. And armies are built on this absolute subordination and the principle is therefore very similar to a bee society or a 
an ant society, any large insect organization, which is, of course, quite dehumanizing, but at the same time, a necessary element for the army's success. But I, I think it is hard to delineate Orientalism and dehumanization, because Orientalism is partly built around the notion of Orient is something that is not us, and we are therefore better and more human. So we kind of dehumanize this significant other around the perceptions of whom we sort of define ourselves. In this sense, of course, um, this bee or fly representations, be they eulogizing, as for example, in support of China's defense and China's resistance against Japan, or be they pejorative and critical, as when, for example, Japanese are depicted as flies which attack China. In both cases, the humanity of a nation is lost to this metaphor of small, the individualized, depersonified masses. So it's not necessarily Orientalist in the sense of uh, they are Chinese or Japanese, they are for their flies. But I would say that you are right in the sense that army or any large mass of people functioning on one command loses its humanity partly as a necessity, but partly also as a psychological phenomenon. And then it becomes this sort of orientalized mass. So I guess it is a very dubious and very complicated question. Uh, Derelig has suggested that uh, orientalism is an expression of something broader. Uh, might some kind of dehumanization be a cultural or anthropological universal? Uh, and is it possible uh, that it was here before the current development uh, like um, elaborated social and subsistence systems or scientific and te technical progress or education or media and uh, and this uh, just created enough power uh, to dehumanize some someone effectively and on the large scale well i think you you have left the hardest question for the last Um, this is something that requires a lot of interpretation of what uh, Derlich actually wrote. And I will allow myself to read a very small quote from him. So he writes that Orientalism could serve as a critique of European modernity and as a means to redirecting it. Uh, so he doesn't actually say so much that Orientalism was an expression of something broader, as rather he suggests that Orientalism was in this constant interaction with um, the countries both producing it and inspiring it, so both for the West and for the so-called Orient. Um, and I think it is also important to keep in mind what Derlich writes about his own endeavor from the very start. He says that he would try to uh, reconsider Said's notion of Orientalism from the point of view of how Asians actually participated in the construction of the Orient. So it's not so much about this idea of exclusive or alternative modernity or a larger, broader um, something as this idea to compare Asians' own self-views and views of the other countries to the views of other countries onto the Orient and the way these two views interacted and the way they shaped what we today call our contemporary knowledge of each other. Um, so I would say that when it comes to uh, dehumanizing and dehumanization, it's not necessarily directly connected to either Derlich's or Said's um, Orientalism, but as we have already spoken, uh, this is something um, which takes different shapes, and Orientalism is probably one of its manifestations. Um, 
this sense, you are probably right in asking that maybe some kind of dehumanization is a cultural universal. I, I would not dare step into the field of human psychology, but I would dare to claim that archetypally we always search for enemies and for something that is ours and not ours. That's how we define, that's how a child learns who he or she is and then how we define our society in opposition to the other society. And then of course we learn that we can actually coexist or sometimes we don't, but that is another question. Um, and in this sense, again, you're right in the contemporary mass media and social media, of course, create this very fertile ground for uh, all sorts of humanizing and dehumanizing metaphors and means of communication. Uh, because, of course, when we, um, when we communicate online, we sometimes dehumanize even the representatives of the same country, uh, you know, because we do, we are communicating with the screen, even the way we are communicating right now, you know, through the medium of hardware, uh, it sort of changes the way I look at you, the way I think about the person with whom I'm talking, right? So this definitely changes and it, it is not necessarily dehumanization, but it certainly affects the scope and scale at which we perceive each other. So uh, Derlick was probably thinking about slightly different things when he was writing his uh, Chinese history um, and the question of Orientalism. And this is um, this paper I consider one of the uh, important readings for for thinking about China's Orientalism. But um, it's certainly true that dehumanization sometimes underlies a lot of human choices and decisions and perceptions. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so thank you for very much for your lectures and lecture and for your answers. And uh, we may look forward to uh, further lectures uh, in this uh, Orientalism series. So thank you. I will be looking forward to them too. Thank you very much.